Dear Professor Ignatieff, members of the board, dear families and friends, dear members of the faculty and staff, I present to you the class of 2017 of the Master of Public Policy. With the 140 graduates, that wasn't bad, by the way. Um, I also present to you the very first 24 graduates of the Master of International Affairs. There you are. And last but not least, seven graduates of the Hertie School's PhD program in governance. Since there are only seven, I think we need to help them. So. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, together they constitute the largest graduating cohort in the school's history. We were just little more than 20 in 2007 and you now number over 170 today. And as I look upon you, you come from 40 countries. It is just a very nice sign of the international nature of the Hertie School that we have so many different groups and nationalities at the school. And I do share with you, I think, a sense of pride and accomplishment on this very special occasion. During your time at the Hertie School, you will have experienced many memorable moments both inside and outside the school, as we learned last night, by the way, during the cabaret. And I do hope that you will look back at your time here with great fondness and perhaps even a little nostalgia. Here are some facts, facts about you. 25 of you completed a dual degree program with one of our five partner universities. 12 participated in the Atlantis program and 23 of you went abroad for an exchange. Over 50 of you took a professional year, not only in this country, but in many others, be they in Albania, be they in Costa Rica, Kosovo, the United States, or Vietnam. Around 70 of you completed internships in some 20 countries, going as far afield as Puerto Rico, Myanmar, or South Africa. You are an exceptional group of graduates. You generally speak three to four languages hold two degrees, and already studied, volunteered, or worked in three or more countries. You are polyglot, well-educated, and mobile. You are a talented group of young people, indeed. We will remember you, the MPP and MIA student uh, class of 2017, for many things, and allow me just to mention three. First, the Hertie School Social Response Group. Students of the class of 2017, namely Colette Boykman, John Torino, and Pamela Cardenas, founded a group which organizes volunteering opportunities. The city of Berlin recognized 10 Hertie students, all part of the response group, with an award for commitment and contributions to assisting volunteers. And I think they deserve applause for that. And then there is the International Relations Club. Two of our first MIM graduates, Christopher Norman and Anas Attal, founded the club as a student forum for discussing international affairs, diplomacy, and global issues. And last but not least, the Governance Post, our online student policy magazine. Special thanks here go to the entire editorial team and the executive editors, namely Nathan, Appelman, Lisa Gao, and Clara Maria Schröder, and of course, Isabella Vera. Thank you so much. As of today, dear graduates, you will become alumni of the school and join a growing network 
that already numbers over 1,200. Like these alumni, you will seek and pursue careers in a wide range of fields. With one, of you, uh, with one third of you working for governments and international agencies, one third in the corporate world, and another third in civil society organizations like NGOs and foundations. And if past records are a guidance, virtually all of you will have found a job within a few months of graduating. This is a great relief, I think, to the parents in the room. <laughs> and, and last year, and this is a very proud fact, last year we had a near perfect placement record for our graduates. So let me tell you how delighted we are uh, to see also seven PhD students complete their degrees today. Congratulations on your achievements. We're very proud that all of you have already have good positions lined up, either as assistant professors, postdoctoral fellows, or as researchers at uh, research institutes and foundations. Uh, sure, I speak for all of us here that when I say that we're really looking forward to seeing how your career in academia unfolds, and in many ways, you're now one of us. So welcome to the club. Special thanks also. <laughs> Special thanks goes to the staff at the school from various departments. First, the student affairs team, who worked so hard to help you get settled at the school and in Berlin. Then there is the graduate programs team, who attended to your academic needs over the last two or three years. The, the career services team, who supported you in internships, professional years, and career advice. And, of course, the communications team, who effortless, that effortless, effortlessly worked to make today's graduation event and the many other events that we have at the school throughout the academic year such a pleasant success. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce today's commencement speaker, Michael Ignatiev. Michael Ignatiev is president of the Central European University in Budapest. Prior to that, he was professor at the Harvard Kennedy School, served in the Canadian Parliament, and was leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. He received his doctorate in history from Harvard and held academic posts at Cambridge and the Universities of Toronto and British Columbia. Michael is an international commentator on contemporary issues of democracy, human rights, and governance. He's an award-winning writer, teacher, politician, and historian, a historian with a very deep knowledge of Central and Eastern Europe. Today, he will speak, about us, he will speak to us about the importance of academic freedom, a topic that couldn't be more timely. As you may be aware, in April of this year, the President of Hungary signed into law an amendment of the Hungarian National Higher Education Act, which targets the Central European University directly and restricts in very serious ways academic freedom. It is no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that universities and public policy schools in particular become target of anti-democratic illiberal forces. Schools such as ours are relatively independent spaces for reflection, for research, for teaching and debating about a wide range of issues, about issues about which you can have rather different views. Our vital role as a school of public policy, as a school of governance, is listening to and debating such conflicting views and sorting out the facts and assessing the evidence. The added value of public policy schools is research and debate about policy choices that directly affect citizens. Considering the norms and the normative foundations which these alternatives are based on and what their implications might be. Therefore, threatening the Central European University means threatening all of us. It sends a terrible sign of endangering academic freedom worldwide. We at Aherty School will support you. We will stand by you, President Ignatiev. May the Central European University continue to prosper and live up to its mission and be, I quote, a source of support for building open and democratic societies that respect 
human rights and human dignity. Professor Ignatiev, we are most honored to have you here with us today. Thank you for taking the time to come to the Hertie School and to speak to our graduates and their families and friends about such an important and timely topic. The floor is yours. It's a uh, great honor to be here. Last time I was here was for a concert. I never imagined I'd be standing in front of you. It's a pretty impressive, awe-inspiring sight. But uh, fortunately, I have the Ambassador of Canada here to protect me. Merci, Monsieur Dion. Um, I must uh, make my country proud, at least, anyway. Um, I, I take the honor of addressing you as a sign of solidarity between two institutions. It means a great deal to me personally, and it means a tremendous amount to a distinguished group of faculty, staff, and students and alumni in a city that's pretty close by, Budapest. Wonderful place. Hope you'll come. I hope all of you will feel welcome in Budapest. Um, uh, we're on Nader Utsa 15. We serve a pretty good espresso. Anytime you come by, you'll be most welcome to see you. Uh, I'm also aware that um, I am a kind of obstacle standing in the way of dessert. Uh, that is, dessert for you is getting your degrees, hugging your loved ones, going out afterwards. I understand we're going to fling our, these beautiful things in the air. There, there's a lot of joy ahead, uh, so, and I know we're going to get to the joy. Um, I'm going to be a little somber before we get there, but I'm aware that a man who stands in the way of dessert um, has only a limited amount of time before I exhaust your patience. Um, I, I do want to uh, talk directly to the class of 2017 because you stand on the cusp. It's a moment to pause in your life and think about standing between the world of academic life and the professional life outside that you're just about to join, and I want to use this moment to talk to you a little bit about the relationship between the world of the university and the world that you're about to join. As uh, my host has so kindly said, I'm, I'm the president of a university under attack, fighting to remain a free institution in Budapest, a free institution just like you. Um, and our battle has become a bit of a European and even global cause celebre. But I do want to say something particularly to Turkish colleagues in the room, to Russian colleagues in the room. We understand we're not the only university that's under attack. Across Turkey, universities are being padlocked, professors are being purged. In St. Petersburg, one of our sister universities is constantly struggling against one ingenious, malicious attempt to close it after another. So we're not alone. CEU is not a special case. There are too many examples of this, and I want to focus your attention on it for a minute. Those are the threats from without, but I want, before I talk about those threats from without, to talk about a much more difficult subject, which is the threats to academic freedom from within, because we need to think about those as well. Just this year at Middlebury College in Vermont, a crowd shouted down a conservative author because they didn't like conservative views. In Oregon, a professor was harassed for refusing to join a protest against racism. Here in Berlin and in Dresden, professors have been bullied for conservative views or for attempting to explain the appeal of the extreme far right in Germany. Now, it's the heart and soul of universities, this one, my one, to be critical. But we have to be courageous enough to be critical of ourselves and the action of some of our members. And the young people responsible for shouting down people they don't want to listen to, 
I think, confuse criticism and harassment. And there's a lesson for all of us here. There is no pleasure in life more satisfying than a little bit of righteous indignation, especially when it's fueled by political conviction. I've been in the throes of righteous indignation in politics, and what I'll tell you is that it can lead you wrong. It can cut you off from the honest self-reflection, which ought to be the core of university life. And it's especially dangerous, this kind of righteousness, when it's couched in the language of anti-militarism, anti-sexism, or anti-fascism. So, and the, and the still darker message here, and one we all need to think about, is that those who sometimes do freedom most harm are those who benefit from it most. So let's stand back from these controversies for a minute and then ask, what is this academic freedom that is threatened from within, in the examples I gave you, and threatened from without by states, corporate interests, other, other interests? And we need to be honest about this because we take academic freedom for granted and sometimes abuse it. But out there, there are a lot of people who think about academic freedom, those people who are far away from our seminar rooms, never got a chance to be in our research labs or in our libraries, many of these people regard academic freedom as a privilege and a dubious privilege at that. Now those of us who live inside universities and who benefited from a fantastic education, we know how privileged we actually are. But there's a discomfort about our privilege and there should be some discomfort. Our salaries are paid for by citizens who may never have had the chance to study with us. We need to always be able to justify ourselves to our fellow citizens and to ensure that the doors of our privileged places are always open, that we communicate our research in the most accessible manner possible to our fellow citizens, and that we do everything to remove any barriers that exclude our fellow citizens and our fellow human beings from the chance to learn with us. If we have privileges, if we are privileged, then those privileges come with responsibilities and we need to discharge them conscientiously. Let's deal with another privilege which we don't talk about very much, which is our job security. I'm now talking to tenured professors. Um, if you ask people on the street what academic free freedom means, Sometimes they'll say it means professors have a job for life. They have job security. They have a job security that none of us working stiffs ever have, okay? And so we need to face that concern about academic freedom directly. We need to remind the public, the democratic public, that tenure protects them too by defending the right to pursue unpopular research and take unpopular positions. One of the ways we need to think about academic freedom is that it's a counter-majoritarian guarantee of a free society. It's like the free press. It's like independent judiciary. And like all privileges, academic freedom can be abused, but many of the professors in this room have used it to advance social knowledge, advance learning. Many of you will remember these professors for the rest of your life because they did their jobs. They didn't abuse tenure. They used it to expand the common and public good. Tenure is not the only issue that is unpopular when we begin talking about academic freedom. One of the places where academic freedom gets a bad name is on the television, or on the radio, or in the social media. Um, you talk to ordinary people and they will say, the thing that drives me crazy about those experts, they get up on television, they talk down to us, they talk about us, and they don't know the first thing about us at all. That pontification of experts has done academic freedom a lot of harm. And I'll confess, as someone who's sometimes been labeled a public intellectual, I, can, I do have to confess, since it's fess up time here, a couple of occasions when I was on television and talked about stuff that I really wasn't competent to talk about. The message for you, young, young leaders of tomorrow, is stick to what you know. Be honest enough to ask yourself, what do I truly know something about, and talk about that, and actually shut up about the rest. 
These are, these are the disciplines of using freedom and intellectual freedom uh, wisely. Now we know that the popular dislike of expertise is exploited by politicians everywhere you look. The deliberate cultivation of suspicion and hatred towards academic life and towards expertise. This is a central element in what we call populism, pitting the people, honest, plain speaking, unlettered, against the complacent, entitled minority in this room. All of us need to stand up against this politics of bad faith. We need to say clearly, humbly, but insistently that our societies would cease functioning without the academic and scientific knowledge produced in universities around the world. And populist leaders who win votes by despising experts on electoral platforms, and each of you can choose your favorite example of this. We know what happens when they get into office. They're fumbling around in confusion and darkness because they've despised the experts and the expertise that allows them actually to govern honestly and fairly. So, we need to stand up to that. But it's not enough to defend our expertise if all the public hears is a defense of our corporate privileges. Because the deep problem here I'm trying to get at is an erosion between the, of the connection between academic freedom and the freedom of all citizens. If universities are going to regain the democratic support that they need, it's important for all of us inside to respond honestly to the criticism we hear from outside, instead of wincing in silent complicity when our colleagues abuse the freedoms we need to defend. I've loved university life since I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto, but I can't begin to count the number of times I've sat in a seminar room and listened to my fellow colleagues, some of my fellow friends, engage in complex, self-referential, congratulatory language games that have no serious engagement with stubborn reality at all. And we need to be gut gutsy enough as colleagues and friends to admit that some academics give academic freedom a bad name. We need to be self-critical if we're going to defend this freedom. But equally, equally, lest you think I'm succumbing to the populist tide, we need to stand up for the great ones, because there are some great ones. Every one of us who's done graduate work has great ones, people we remember with deep emotion. I think of Judas Sklar, I think of Isaiah Berlin, I think of Albert Hirschman, I think of David Landis. And there's a great one in this audience who I just met a minute ago again, Klaus Offa. These are people who add luster, who add distinction to freedom, because their work expresses a moral obligation to the truth and a deep commitment to clarity, a sense that clarity is a moral obligation to your fellow citizens. These are the ones whose use of freedom adds luster to our own. Now, I've said something in criticism inside because it seems to me that's what we need to do to be a, a living community, to be critical of ourselves. And let me talk a little bit about the threats from without. I did not want to use this platform to rehearse my, what the British call my little local difficulty in Budapest. I can only say that negotiations may be underway between the government of Hungary and the uh, uh, governor of the state of New York, which is where we are accredited. And I want those negotiations to succeed. And I want to resume the, the daily life of universities. It seems a long time ago I had a daily life, but I passionately want to resume all of that daily life as soon as possible. But I do want to reflect, especially for the students here, on what that episode has taught me about freedom. I think I've learned something perfectly simple. It's a blinding cliche, but when you get as old as I am, you, you understand one thing about life. Some cliches just happen to be true. Academic freedom, like all freedoms, is worth what you're prepared to pay for it. And those who don't fight for your freedom will surely lose it. That's lesson number one from our battle. How have we been able to fight? Not simply because we have a wonderfully inventive student body, a courageous alumni, fantastic professors. 
We've also had the freedom that comes from a private endowment. Let me be, be very clear. We have the institutional sinews to resist and fight. But that comes with another tension in academic freedom that needs to be honestly discussed. Academic freedom is not just freedom from the state, it's also freedom from the people who pay your bills. It's freedom from the philanthropies who support you. It's a double freedom against private interests that may impede the freedom of research and teaching, and it's freedom uh, from the state. And I come out of the battle for CEU more convinced than ever that financial independence of universities is critically important to the, their academic freedom. Institutions that are totally dependent on government funding have a tough time standing up to the government when it gets tough. One of the things that has been inspiring to me about our battle is that institutions exclusively dependent on public support in Hungary have had the guts to stand up beside us. And I salute th because they've actually paid something to defend academic freedom. But the foundations of academic freedom are always more secure when they rest on a number of pillars. Let me move towards a conclusion. Our freedom, the freedom of academic institutions can never be separated from the health of democratic institutions. It has been the weakness of democratic institutions in Hungary that has rendered us so uniquely vulnerable. There's no ivory tower where we're safe, folks. Unless we stand up for the democracy that protects us all, we will be picked off. That's a lesson I have learned from the Hungarian story. As you graduate today, you will be a generation that is called to defend democracy from demagogues, from populists, possibly, I hope not, from fascists. But the most dangerous enemy of all may be indifference, the indifference deep in your own hearts and souls, the indifference in all of us towards democracy. And when we become indifferent to democracy, democracy begins to die, and with it, our freedom. And let's just remember, once again, why we care about democracy at all. Because it's a noble ideal of community. The idea of a group of human beings forming a community, ruling themselves by consent, and forming an arrangement to care for each other through time. That's what a democracy is. And where, where, I ask you, did that idea of democracy first take root? It took root in the medieval communities of scholars. It took root, in fact, in universities, in many of the other places it took root. But it took root first in universities. Think about this. In the community of scholars, in the great medieval universities of Bologna, Salamanca, Oxford, Cambridge, Sorbonne, Heidelberg, Tübingen, and the great early modern universities of Eastern Europe, which we must never forget, Charles University in Prague, Jagiellonian in Krakow, Ietros Loren in Budapest. These are institutions that have been going for centuries, and over centuries they've managed to keep alive the idea of, of self-rule, communities governing themselves in freedom. And that is the kernel of the very idea of democracy. And the university should be the epitome, the living embodiment of democracy in action. As future leaders, you may be called on to defend freedom. So you better know what it is. You better know what democracy is, why it matters to you. And it's worth remembering, as I have discovered painfully, that freedom is never secure. We must battle against its enemies within. We must battle against our enemies without. But the outcome of any battle for yourself always turns on convincing your federal citizens that when you battle for yourself, you are always and ultimately battling for them. Thank you.
Dear graduates, dear class of 2017, congratulations. We now play a song for you that was composed in Berlin in the time of the Great Depression. It became one of the most popular songs performed by the comedian harmonists, and it's about the pursuit of happiness. It's called Irgendwo auf der Welt somewhere in the world. Dear class of 2017, <laughs> dear proud parents and relatives, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to honor the students who've completed their PhD studies in the academic year 2016-2017. My name is Michaela Kreinfeld and I'm the PhD director at the Hertie School of Governance and I'm also a professor of sociology. My main field of research is fertility. And as such, I'm well prepared to serve as a PhD director. <laughs> Just as pregnancy and birth, the PhD period is full of uncertainty and hope. <laughs> the last period is laborious and painful, but once the PhD is submitted, and successfully defended in front of the PhD committee, 
the joy is unmeasurable. Now it is time to congratulate our newborn doctors of political science. Before we do so, let me briefly say a couple of words on our doctoral program. Since 2012, we've been accredited by the Berlin Senate and by the German Science Council to run a doctoral program. Although our program is relatively young, we have already issued 20 PhD titles. The majority of our former PhDs have stayed in academia. In fact, three out of our first PhD students are already holding positions as associate or assistant professors at international universities. A third of our PhD graduates utilizes their skills in politics and public administration. It is the mission of our doctoral program to not just conduct research in the classical fields of public policy. Instead, our ambition is to conceptualize public policy as a discipline that also covers the practice of governing. This mission is also visible in the PhD topics that I will read, read out to you in a second. Altogether, there were seven PhD students who completed their studies in the academic year 2016-2017. Unfortunately, three of them could not be here today. I would nevertheless take the opportunity to congratulate them for they, their achievements. And that is Carlo Draut, who worked on tax firms and human rights, understanding institutional and stakeholder pressures along the value chain. It's Thomas Müller-Ferber, the design of nuclear reversal negotiations and its effectiveness after the Cold War. And it's Zoe Philip Williams, who worked on risky business or risky politics, what explains investor state disputes. Congratulations to Carlo, Thomas and Zoe. I'm delighted that four of our PhD students who graduated this year are here today and to celebrate with us. So um, let me now read out the titles and their theses and then invite them on stage. But before, I would like to ask our president back on stage who will issue the certificates. Helmut Anheyer. So let me invite Arndt Leininger on stage. <laughs> Arndt worked on direct democracy and represent representative governments. Congratulations. <laughs> Mauritz Meyers. Mauritz worked on contagious Euroscepticism, the impact of Eurosceptic challenger parties on mainstream party attitudes towards European integration. Congratulations, Mauritz. <laughs> Anita Tiefensee. Anita worked on wealth and inheritance in Europe. Congratulations, Anita. Armin von Schiller. Armin worked on the importance of consent, the politics of progressive taxation in developing countries. Congratulations.
that it, uh, it feels so good to finally have your PhD. I remember it as if it were yesterday. It's, um, it's good. Before I turn the podium over to uh, today's student speakers, let me take this opportunity to thank the members of the Hurdy Student Association and the student representatives from the various programs for their fantastic work and also uh, for organizing last night's uh, student cabaret, which I, I think was just uh, really well done and very funny indeed. So, uh, and I think the class of 2017 is truly lucky for having had such a dedicated group of people in the student associations and among the representatives. And I think you really earn a good round of applause for the work you did. And as in, as in previous years, the student speakers, the, the ones that you will hear now, were elected by the class of 2017. And this year, the student speakers are Raju Adhikari from the Master of Public Policy Program uh, from Nepal, and Colette Boykman from the MIA Program, and she comes from the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. So please come over here. And those rare sunny days when Berlin could have been mistaken for Barcelona. With a backpack full of documents, you must have stared through the same glass door on Friedrichstrasse 180, as I did. In my best summer outfit. Because they say, first impression is the last impression. I didn't take that hidden elevator. Neither did I. Not because it was too slow. But because I wanted to stop spontaneously stumble onto you. So I could say, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? When did you get here? Where have you gone? Do you have an apartment yet? How much is the rent, dear? Can you answer this phone in German? Oh, my account is blocked, so next week I'll pay you in beer. <laughs> from beer, I remember, under Tempelhof's scorching sun, we were sipping on hot Berliner Pilsner. Beads of sweat falling down our forehead. The only time in two years that we missed out on free pizza? Was when we decided to act polite instead. At that time, we had simply made eye contact. We had simply waved at each other. But when we first spoke, my heart skipped a beat when you told me that you had learned my language. My heart skipped a beat when you told me you were at my country during the earthquake. During the blast. During the festival. During the fast. Our conversation moved to private colleges in America and their exorbitant fees, to your unpaid internships slash vacation in Asia and talks about saving the bees. When you finally said, excuse me, please, seeing me struggle with that hot pilsner, you decided to hand me a cold Augustiner. Taste this, you said, plucking the top of that bottle with a lighter like it was some kind of a magic trick. <laughs> you plucked me out of my world and brought me into yours. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raju Adhikari. And my name is Colette Bergman. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> First of all, congratulations uh, to all the graduates, MPP, MIA, and PhD, who are all going to rock the stage soon in their shiny scarves and their fancy outfits. And also congratulations to the professors, professors at Hertie who have helped yet another cohort graduate. You had to deal with a lot of late submission requests, a lot of generic answers just to gain participation points, a lot of questions and emails that you are sure you had touched upon in class. So we genuinely want to thank you for the help and support to get us here. Congratulations to the Herdy staff, from communications to student affairs, from graduate team to career services, from events to IT to cafeteria. You had to deal with many annoying emails, all with the same issues from us. Many times you had the pleasure to inform and guide us. Many times we had the pleasure to correct you. Yet, 
yet we both survived to see this day, so congratulations to you as well. Then congratulations to all the partners, the families and friends that have traveled from near and far to be in this room with us today. You might have had many sleepless nights. <laughs> you might have had many sleepless nights rereading and editing the stuff that we sent you, or you were just there for us to pour us a big cup of tea or coffee or anything stronger when we most needed it. So we really want to thank you for your care and support. We would also like to acknowledge uh, today's speaker, Dr. Ignatiev, uh, who made the effort to come and speak to us and to remind us the importance of academic freedom, for giving us an insight on the threat to academic freedom, both from inside and outside. Uh, at the end of the day, when everything is said and done, despite our degrees, despite what we aim to be and what we wish to do, if the sanctity, the freedom, and the growth of academic institutions are chained, then we cannot move forward. So thank you for coming and talking to us. Then we would also like to acknowledge some important characters in our lives that maybe couldn't be present in this room today. So for some of you, that might be your dog, your cat, your rabbit, your bird. For others, it might be the incredible shows on Netflix that you binge watch during the thesis. Shout out to our boy Aziz Ansari. For some, it was the opportunity in your career, in your field, in your respective countries that encouraged you to push forward, uh, push yourself forward and succeed. For others, it was the scarcity, the corruption, the hate, the crime, the rise of demagogues that pushed you to be that intellectual pioneer of change. And then we would also like to acknowledge our friends that started our Hurti careers with us, but that maybe took a professional year or have already graduated, because we are much more than a cohort. So you may be in Tanzania, in Costa Rica, in Nigeria, in India, in the US, or in Germany. You may have decided to abandon us for Sciences Po or SIPA, but you are still a very big part of our Hurti experience, and you are very close to our hearts. Last but not the least, we want to thank the Hurti School, which has been more than a sum of its parts, which has become a safe space for all of us to be who we are, despite, regardless of what gender, religion, sexuality, background, philosophy we wish to be identified with. It has become a solace from the Berliner Schnauze, all the grueling bureaucracy and the language barrier. It became a place where we felt comfortable to raise issues, and to discuss about everything and anything, whether it's in person or on Facebook. So we want to acknowledge Hurti for giving us, and we had to say this at some point, hashtag Hurti love. <laughs> so for all the seen and unseen, human and non-human forces that have inspired you, and that have conspired this celebration, this union, we would like to acknowledge them all with a big round of applause. Woo! Okay. So now we want to go to the actual speech, and how do we want to do this? So on the one hand, we're all soaked wet with hurty experiences, all the laughter, the memories, the nostalgia that has already begun, even though we haven't said our goodbyes yet. On the other hand, there are a plethora of things happening around the world that somehow willingly or unwillingly made us happy, angry, sad, mad, all these emotions that we experienced together in these two years at Hurdy. And then lastly, there's the premise of graduation. The, the premise of you and me and all of us walking out of this hall into the world without really knowing what we're going to do yet or where the world will take us. So it's a lot to talk about, but there's never the enough time, nor there's the best way to do it. So we would like to present you another piece of spoken word before we say goodbye. So just in case if people don't know what spo spoken word is, it's an oral form of art that includes poetry that is meant to be recited out loud. So the poem that we wrote is meant to represent every single one of you. And so when we say I, that's not me or Raju, that is any one of you. And when we say we, that is all of us. So just to keep that in mind. I come from the mountains, 
Some days they are shiny peaks, heaven and earth we call them. Some days they are walls, beyond them is a world full of promise not everyone can reach for. I come from cities, each one with a different language, a different culture and tradition, in its pursuit of progress or while facing adversity, bound by a union. I come from the continent, where the shades of skin color and the flavors of food do not fit in a box. I can simply make my tortilla a spoon and scoop whatever deliciousness I can fit in my palm. I can simply slip into my dancing shoes and salsa to whatever techno beat is on. I am the Urdu, the Farsi, the Arabic, the Swahili, and all its beautiful phrases of love and peace. I am both belief and science, reason and religion, the big bang, the big man, the quiet book, the loud feast. I am the thick accent that you cannot make fun of, because yours is thicker than mine. <laughs> if you are Italy. I am India. If you are Colombia. I am China. You and I can fight on Facebook over gender rights and economic ties, over Kashmir and Palestine. Over who's more charming, Pierre or Parado? Over who's your favorite, Kaiser or Enderlein? But we are still part of the same International Affairs Club, the same EPPC troop. The same Data Nerds team, the same Desi Hurdy group. We both ran that half marathon, stride to stride. And when we're stuck at a math problem? We both blame the professor to protect our pride. There were events we both signed up for, but didn't show up. There were events we both showed up for, but didn't speak up. Because we, we are misrepresentation. We are misrepresentation as sub-Saharan Africa in our classrooms as women in our boardrooms, as immigrants in the fast lane of airport lines, as continents, as colors, as checkboxes in people's stereotyped eyes. Because we, we are privileged. Despite our differences, yours is bound with mine. Because we, we are ego. Behind smiley faces, we are fighting with each other to shine. But we, we are also Berlin. So we had to knock down them walls. To pick up each other's baggages that we brought over from our world. At Herdy, we found it all between classrooms and parties and picnics and trips, between handshakes and hugs and applauses and the kiss on your lips, all wrapped into small memories. Like when we both got locked out of the building with nothing but a pack of cigarettes. And we decided to puff the paper deadline into thin air. Or when we failed in our search for free food. But there was always someone in the kitchen who had saved some and was kind enough to share. Like when your Wi-Fi didn't get installed for three weeks. Or was it three months? And the library became your home. You were dipped in sweat and tears to ace that first essay. Without knowing that you would receive an 85 either way. <laughs> or when you knocked back wine after each event, sneaking behind Mr. Furman's suspicious eyes. You thought you could forget with a few Moscatos that the day is coming when you have to say your goodbyes. Like when you freaked out for the mood court. Reading between every stupid line. And when your country presentation seemed improbable, you simply migrated to someone else's country. Hoping that would be your way to shine. At Herdy, we lived it all. The fun, the fights, the sleepless nights. The after party, the pregame routine, the cheap Ryanair flights. That took you and me to places near and remote. Each one with a unique story, each one with a crazy anecdote. But every time we landed back here, it felt like home. If Berlin was our house, Hertie was that cozy room. A playground, a safe space, each of us walking in our own pace. To learn, to love, to explore and thrive, to question, to reason, to listen and to strive. Today, as you step out of this hall, hungry and hungover from all these speeches, you will once again hit that glass door at Friedrichstrasse 180 you will still choose to take the stairs. This time, when you see a face that you do not have these memories with, to whom you haven't had a chance to say, remember, we did this together, introduce yourself. Without your spoken resume, without sneaking in your cover letters. Post your wine and tell them from your heart how confused you are. Show them how scared, how excited, how funny you are. So that later, when your elbows are sore and your diploma is dusty, you will smile remembering the last thing you did at Herty. Thank, Thank you. you.
Well done. Well, dear board members, colleagues, staff, families and friends, and the class of 2017. All right. I would like to keep my comments short so that we indeed get to this dessert that we've been hearing a lot about. So I have one story and one point to make. My story is as follows. Last April, I took a flight to India for the very first time, and the goal was to attend an academic conference. Now, I was thinking about tax competition and the like, but on the way, I agreed to meet with a former student of ours. After I landed, I got an email from another former student of ours. This student was now working on an independent project in Nepal on health issues in Nepal. A day later, I got yet another email from a former student of ours who worked for the German Development Corporation. Now, two days later, after the conference was done, I finally got a chance to meet the student I thought I was coming to see. And I looked around the table, and there were two other faces that I recognized. And I thought, where do I know you from? Well, it turned out that this former student of ours, who was on the stage two years ago, okay, had started his own consulting firm. And he'd hired two students from this year in professional years. So looking around, thinking I was going to meet one student, in the end, I met several students, both current and former. Well, that's my very quick story. The idea here, though, is that there's a whole network, not just in India, but in other countries, too. And one thing I learned is that these Hertians stay in contact with one another. They see each other. They help each other. And my main point is just to keep in mind that when you leave today, you're not leaving and graduating and saying goodbye. No, you are going to be a Hertian for the rest of your lives. Because you're a for the rest of your lives, you'll stay in touch with each other. You'll stay in touch with us and with other staff. And my hope really is that you help each other and you help future students who come through the Heritage School. So that was my very, very short story and my one simple point. I think, President Anheyer, it is now time to confer the degrees to the class of 2017. I'm going to read your names and please come forward. Dana Abdel Fatah. Christoph Abels. Raju Adhikari. Adrene Sare Algerin Tovar. Hector Alonso. Rita Alvarez Martinez. Camille Aimoto. Anas Atal. <laughs> Mirza Shoaib Baig. <laughs> Ayesha Baizden. <laughs> Emily Bell. <laughs> Laura Benning. Maria Felicia Carlotta Sophia Bernheimer. <laughs> Colette Boykman. <laughs> Jill Byton. <laughs> Julia Black. Beatrice Blythe. <laughs> Coin Fruk Boz. <laughs> Ariana Casoli Alvregna. 
Daniela Cepeda Cuadarro. Michael Chato. Dennis Clement. Milan Danen. Ryan Duncan. Lea Duplan. Parmita Tuta. Victoria Dykes. Miguel Angel Espinosa Calvo. Sandra Esser. John Evers. Anna Favero. Henrik Tobias Frank. Benjamin Florian Geiser. Ariana Yadira Gaitan Yazo. Laia Grido Angeron. Andrea Gemovic. Gabriel Goll. Lisa Go. Zachary Griar. Gloria Jessica Guerrero Martinez. Marcel Hadid. Elisa Hedermann. <laughs> Natalie Herberger. <laughs> Robin Hönig. <laughs> Christopher Hubert. <laughs> Suel Hosenzade. Pamela Jimenez Cardenas. Isaac M. Joseph. Paolo Henrique Calcaca. Christopher Kardish. Dominique Carl. <laughs> Matthias Kaspers. <laughs> Tarun Khanna. <laughs> Alexander Kripko. <laughs> Bomi Kim. Jion Kim. Torben Klause. Jeffrey Klein. Evgenia Krucker. Christoph Kühn. Osman Kum. Wan Ting Amanda Lee.
Karline Lersch. Jessica Young Cohen. Andres Lodonio Botero. Carlina Lopez. Ria Lucatina. Nicola McCall. Nara Mari. Max Emmanuel Manweiler. Asher Manahorn. Juva Matua. Ben Luis Anton Meyer. Sophie Meiser. David Mills. Marilia Montiero. Mayank Mudgil. Magdalena Münich. Sophie Münzberg. Daniel Murphy. Christopher Newman. Anna Theresa Niederle. Christopher Norman. Nicholas Olson. Marine Paclet. Giovanna Panic. Benedetta Pavese. Judy Perkins. Carlotta Piantieri. Devar Podar. Jose Angel Quintanilla Noriega. Killian Reiser. Krishna Kumar Rajamanar. Matthew Rawson. Jana Reinbay. Shoshana Richards. Fanny Brees. Camila Rodriguez Vieira. Mariano Alonso Rodriguez Vigueras. Austin Romeo. Thorsten Asger Rainier Rubek. Jeremy Russell. Alexander Sacharo. Ana Rocio Sandras Mendoza. Lena Elke Scheffel.
Dennis Schmagen. Dinesh Mechel. Raphael Schmutziger Goldzweig. Paula Schneemelche. Klaus Schröder. Kim Sophie Schulter. Ingrid Schulter. Mimosa Sedio. Naol Seemann. Schrufe Simikomar. Florian Tobias Sonntag. Samantha Michelle Spilka. Seer Tali. Heike Henrika Lucy Ten Den. Frederik Traut. John Michael Toyano. Akash Uber. Mariana Gabriel Valentini. Maria Chiara Vicky Guerrero. Mansi Wadwa. Axel Christian Waldbach. Nora Warning. Matthias David Weire. Florian Tobias Wiesböck. Line Winterhof. Sarah Worthing. Anna Kristin Vreda. Martin Zayev. Maria Dalmar Zamor Dominguez. Jeffrey Charles Peter Zampieri. Yuzu Zhang. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the class of 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear friends, uh, we will now take a photo here in the hall on stage with the class of 2017. And uh, afterwards, uh, you are all invited to the Hertie School for a reception. But on the way from here to the Hertie School, 
we can stop and we will stop on the stairs of the concert hall and there will be uh, photo opportunities there and I think we'll also have another picture taken there. So uh, just give us about a minute or two to have the f kind of the official class of 2017 photo shot right here and then uh, you're free to roam around and uh, then we meet you outside. Okay. Uh, I think all that's left uh, for us, for the faculty and the staff of the Hertie School, is for us to, to thank Regina Kreitz and her excellent team for organizing this so well uh, today, and uh, to thank you, the parents and the friends, for supporting these excellent students, and um, farewell. Oh, it's, it's there. Just in case you, uh, you don't know, the photographer is all the way up there. Look.